Yanko Wango. Let's go. Yanko Wango. Let's go. But I want to play it smart. Yanko Wango. Let's go. A brand new start. Yanko Wango. Let's go. But I want to fly. Yanko Wango. Let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hot, go smart. Start. Yanko Bongo, let's go. Hot. I want to fly. Yanko Bongo, let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hot, go smart. Start. Yanko Bongo, let's go. Hush. I want to fly. Yanko Bongo, let's go. Give great a try. Live your best life every day with the Smart Network. Hush. Go smart. Yanko Bongo. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar Women in Entrepreneurship conducted by the Chamber Academy of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce in collaboration with the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce, Sri Lanka and the Global Victoria, Australia. On the onset, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors, Hutchington Telecommunication Lanka Private Limited and London Stock Exchange Group, Sri Lanka. Without further ado, I would like to inform everyone of the house rules. Kindly switch off your cameras and mute your microphones. Only the speakers will use their cameras and microphones uh, for presentation and dialogue. Questions from the participants will only be taken through the chat box. A recording of the session will be shared on the conclusion of the session. I now welcome Shiran Fernando, the Chief Economist of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, to give the opening remarks for today's session. Over to you, Shiran. Thank you, Vishanti. Um, a warm welcome. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're joining us. Um, we're excited to uh, host this webinar and um, in celebration of International Women's Day and the series of uh, events that are uh, celebrated to uh, this week as well as during the month as well. Um, as Vishanti mentioned, um, the Chamber has put this together uh, after much thought uh, together with our partners from the Women's Chamber of commerce and industry in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, the Global Victoria Australia as well. Um, it's a collaboration that we hope uh, would uh, continue uh, beyond this webinar and into more programs where we can explore uh, mutually beneficial topics as well. Uh, so today you will uh, hear uh, a lot about the Global Victoria uh, program and the women's initiative, which uh, I think will be beneficial to um, our entrepreneurs here in Sri Lanka to explore uh, what are the opportunities there as well. 
uh, but also uh, you will hear lots of conversations of uh, and experiences shared by entrepreneurs here in Sri Lanka as well as Australia. So I'm sure it'll be a great uh, sharing of experience session and, and will be of uh, value as well. Uh, so let me thank um, all the speakers who will be introduced shortly. And uh, thank you for their time there uh, and taking part in, and providing their views as well. And uh, we wish at the Chamber all the best uh, for the program and hopefully it'll be one of many dialogues uh, to come. Uh, so with that, let me uh, hand over to uh, Rezani Aziz, who is the CEO of AdFactors PR Sri Lanka and also former uh, past chair person of the Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Sri Lanka to take it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shiran. Uh, thank you, uh, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and uh, all our esteemed panelists and uh, our keynote speaker, Michelle, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, firstly, it's an honor to be part of this uh, webinar. And uh, I will start off by introducing our keynote uh, speaker first, who uh, will deliver her address, after which I will introduce the panelists. And uh, then we will start a conversation, a dialogue, and I'd love if it could be interactive as well. Uh, we will, uh, as uh, Shehara mentioned, uh, there will be, the, the interaction will be via chat, but let's make it as useful as possible for all of us. So first, our keynote, uh, this morning will be by uh, Michelle Wade, who's a commissioner to South Asia for state government of Victoria in Australia. Michelle is a highly experienced international trade official who has held senior diplomatic postings for the Australian government in Italy, Malaysia and Spain. She's managed Victorian government operations and promotion of trade and investment across, across South Asia for several years, overlooking and managing four of Victoria's top 10 education markets being India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Pakistan. She's also responsible for the in-market delivery of Victoria's India strategy. And uh, of particular interest is during COVID-19, Michelle managed the Victorian government's $45 million International Student Emergency Relief Fund, the largest support in Australia for students, which provided welfare payments and support to over 30,000 international students. We are absolutely excited to have uh, you michelle here deliver your keynote over to you great thanks Ratsani, and um good morning to sri lanka and good afternoon to melbourne it's it's wonderful to be here now as is our way in australia i'd like to commence today's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands from where our victorian participants are based today and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present and elders of other communities who may be here today. Uh, a big thank you to Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce in Sri Lanka and our panellists, both from Victoria and Sri Lanka. So it was great to have Ritsani's um, introduction. I've got to say, um, we have worked very closely with AdFactor in India and also, you know, as have many of my friends here. So it's great to have Ratsani here from a company that we hold uh, very highly in regard. And I thank her for all of her work that she does in growing the uh, working relationship and education for entrepreneurs and, and business women and business generally in Sri Lanka. So Ritsani mentioned my role, it's um, facilitation of, of trade, investment and education. Uh, I think of it a little bit as a cultural bridge of understanding uh, and explaining between two cultures how business works, what products, what services might be attractive and emerging and, and where business opportunities are, and putting Victorian exporters in front of um, Indian, uh, sorry, Sri Lankan potential partners, uh, working with Sri Lankan companies who might want to establish operations in Victoria, and then obviously uh, growing our education market in a way that's beneficial to both communities, so targeting the, the students and the need that's going to benefit the wider community. 
So it's been, um, I think International Women's Day now has grown much more than a day. It kind of feels like a week. And it's been a, a great period for me just to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to. Um, on Monday, I was up in Delhi or earlier this week, and I attended a, an event for FIKI, uh, which is the, the Federation of uh, Indian Commerce and Industry, and the launch of uh, the WISE Council, just so that you know what's happening uh, in another market neighbouring you, which is really about um, upskilling of women's IT skills and business. And at that event, we did have the um, Minister for Women for India, and she made some very interesting comments, which I know from having chatted to the uh, to the speakers here today are similar for us all. And it's about um, through COVID and through some of the benefits we've got and the flexibility, we've also had to pick up uh, quite a lot more, more work at home. Um, on International Women's Day, uh, I was interviewed as, as the special guest for the staff there at a very large mission at the High Commission on my experiences. And I also got to participate in an award ceremony to really see the work that the Australian government and its employees are putting their heart and souls into delivering. So that was fantastic. Uh, we also had a virtual launch for Deakin University um, with Symbiosis International University's establishment of a Women Entrepreneurship Research Alliance in Pune. And um, of course, today we're profiling women entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka and Victoria. So I thought, um, firstly, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of the sorts of projects that we work on and the sorts of things that we're interested in, particularly from a women and, and entrepreneurship perspective. And I'll finish up today talking a little bit more about Victorian government and, uh, and gender equality and, and equality more broadly. But for now, I'll just um, talk a little bit more specifically about our relationship between Victoria and Sri Lanka. Um, so a special shout out to you all guys. Um, my family had a wonderful holiday in Sri Lanka just back before things became very challenging for you guys in 2019. Um, and we really wish your tourism sector well. So I, I not only visit uh, your country for work, I've also been to Gaul and Bentota, Ella, Horton National Park is one of my favourite places on earth. And I uh, think of you almost every day because of like any good shopper, I picked up uh, jewellery in candy, okay. uh, which is sort of dedicated to my three children and uh, a ring for each child but uh, also a lovely memory of, of Sri Lanka. So personally, I, I couldn't be a stronger ambassador for your country and wanting to see uh, the tourism get back and, and uh, rise above those challenges. So as I mentioned also, I'm frequently in Sri Lanka uh, and it's a very important market to us. Our work focuses on education, but we're also seeing strong growth in food and beverages and also technology sectors. Uh, which is why it's great to have our panellists here today to share Sri Lankan and Victorian experiences. Um, with trade, uh, we do find it's all about people to people linkages and connectivity. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the Sri Lankan diaspora in Victoria, uh, so people born or children of people born in Sri Lanka, is the largest in Australia. It's about 60,000 people, many professionals in that network and a, a well-regarded, well-integrated part of the richness, which is multicultural Victoria. Um, we have over 10,000 students per year from Sri Lanka to Victoria. That just sounds like a number, a number if I say it like that, but there's two things I really want you to know about it. One is that that has doubled in the last 10 years. So the impact of those young people and those young people that we had to work with to support during the pandemic who remained in Australia, uh, it, it's large. Um, and the other part, to give you an idea of, of not just the size, but the future potential through the awareness that uh, being home to these students brings to us, is that we think uh, it's about the same number as goes to the UK every year. And then in terms of the collaboration that's happening uh, in market, we've got some terrific relationships there. I'm really pleased to say that I've visited all three of these with our former Minister of Trade when we travelled to Sri Lanka back in 2019. Um, we've got Monash University has a relationship 
the Monash College at, at um, UCL at uh, University College Lanka, just outside of um, on the well in Colombo. Um, we've got um, Victoria University has a transnational partnership with National School of Business Management, and I attended a wonderful event at that campus again with the minister. And um, William Anglis Institute's got a partnership with SLIT and uh, to deliver hospitality courses. And I will say I had a fantastic lunch at that uh, institute when we got to deliver, as, got to visit as well, as well as many other education partnerships. But I hope um, this gives you confidence that the relationships, not just students going down, it's about cooperating and delivering uh, relevant coursework uh, to your students in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, prior to the pandemic, Melbourne was the only state in Australia to have direct daily flights with Sri Lanka, and uh, we look forward to these resuming. That's not just about um, ease of, of travel and people to people, it's also about ease of movement of goods and particularly some of that fresh and premium, high quality Victorian uh, products. Uh, we estimate about two thirds of the visits from Sri Lanka to Australia actually went to Victoria. So again, um, those uh, linkages are very strong. And of course, we're hoping that the next big event that we'll see many uh, Sri Lankans to um, Australia and to Victoria will be the T20 World Cup. And we'll see um, the final in Melbourne at the MCG. And of course, the Australian um, cricket team has been very recent guests of Sri Lanka. So later this month, I'm quite excited. We're uh, expecting to formally launch our leading health and wellness brand, Swiss, in Sri Lanka. Um, but for those of you who want to get in early, uh, they have begun selling a range of women's health products on the HealthGuard website. So we look forward to working with them. I'm really hoping that when you see that name, you'll say, ah, oh, we know that name. It's, it's from Victoria and we really are a centre for uh, that industry of, uh, of vitamins, uh, natural cosmetics and products for health and wellbeing. So I hope that's given you a bit of an idea in some of the work around um, study of um, collaborating to import from Australia and also establishing business uh, in Victoria. And uh, my colleague Vidya uh, is a contact for any inquiries that you might have after this event if you don't get a chance for us to answer them today. But as I said, I just wanted to mention a couple of things now about um, gender and, and gender equality. It's a subject very close to my heart. When I did do those talks at, uh, at uh, the High Commission earlier this week, I was able to say, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit old now. And the good thing is, from an Australian perspective, whilst there are some very current and public issues, uh, there are many things that have improved over time. Um, one of the things that I think really needs a shout out to my Victorian male colleagues is pay disparity has come up very much on the agenda in Australia over the last couple of years. And at an executive level, very quietly, without any fair fa fanfare at all, um, our male colleagues a couple of years ago stepped back at an executive level. They forego their pay rise to enable uh, what would have been their pay rise to help close the pay disparity uh, for, for women at a similar level. And I just thought that goes to show, uh, you know, what we want in anything to do with gender and gender equality is not just about us women, it's about the whole of the community and, and recognition of the issue. The things which are, are part of Victoria's gender equality strategy, which has now been going since 2019, and that I've also really seen the benefits of, is um, we have quotas for women on government boards. Um, we have quotas on women on community boards when the boards are fund when the, the organisation uh, receives government funding. If a conference is funded by government, then we have uh, an expectation of a solid number of women in the conference programs. And for our organisation, uh, we also have targets and um, expectations around the number of women in business that will travel on our business missions. And, you know, sometimes it's just really important that you unpick those statistics to say, are we really getting to them? Are we, as we say in Australia, are we turning over enough rocks? Do we know who, who's there and who's in business? And, and this work has really exposed us to uh, a great deal of really qualified business women, which for other reasons we might not have otherwise known, except I would say for looking harder. 
So that's part of the work that we do as uh, Global Victoria Women. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing our experiences to potentially uh, opening up business doors for you with Victoria also. So all the best for the rest of the session. Thanks, Ratsani. Thank you, uh, Michelle. I'm just trying to. Uh, OK. Oops, things gone wrong. All right. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Um, great listening to you and uh, do look forward to cooperating and collaboration. I think some key takeouts from what you said. And um, yeah, in honor of uh, International Women's Day, I'm excited as well to now be presenting our panelists and to get on with the dialogue. Um, so we have with us an impressive panel of outstanding businesswomen from uh, Victoria in Australia as well as Sri Lanka. And uh, that's exactly what we want to share with uh, the audience. The inspiration and the success that these uh, women entrepreneurs have uh, brought to the table who have built global brands. And uh, I mean, not just in their home country, they've gone beyond through dedication, hard work and ambition. So from the tech media and uh, whatever biopharma industries to 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 the traditional fashion and beauty countless self-made women have made their mark as successful business owners and executives but today we've handpicked those that fit in with the IWD theme for this year that's uh, break the bias and who have who are in not the traditional women business roles but who've really gone beyond that. A little bit before I introduce uh, them about, because I, I know Women's Chamber was mentioned, but I, I thought at this point I will quickly butt in and talk a little bit about the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce, of which I've been a member for 30 plus uh, years. Uh, it was started in 1985, and when it was started back then, 37 years ago, uh, we were told that it was the only independent Women's Chamber at that time. Now, they have probably are very many, but we'd like to still uh, call ourselves uh, the oldest independent women's chamber, stood the test of time and has a percentage, a breakup of like uh, 67 to 70% women entrepreneurs, plus a healthy mix of uh, women who are in C-suite chairpersons and uh, board directors of uh, companies, so professionals as well. And we're going to get on to our esteemed panel this morning and this afternoon. We first have Trish Messiter, who's a CEO of Clarinox Technologies. With 20 years as CEO of Clarinox Technologies, Trish has established domain knowledge in short range wireless, particularly Bluetooth and Wi Fi. She has extensive experience in research, engineering, design, sales, marketing, and software technical support, and has been involved in business from startups to, to corporate environments. Trish has co-authored academic works in, on embedded systems in conjunction with RMIT University, participated as an industry award judge, and given presentations at several major international conferences and local universities. So welcome to the panel, Trish. We have Jayomi Lokulian, a co-founder and chief executive officer of Z Messenger. A data-driven digital marketing company. She has played a pivotal role in shaping the digital marketing industry in Sri Lanka and has uh, made her company uh, a, a global brand as well. Uh, she's led digital marketing um, campaigns and strategies for major brands, corporate enterprises, agency, and social missions covering 2,000 plus campaigns. And under her leadership, Z Messenger has emerged as as the leading mobile and digital marketing solutions provider here in Sri Lanka, won numerous accolades over the years, including the title South Asia's best digital marketing and social media company. Jayobi, on a personal level, was recognized as one of 50 most powerful women in business by a leading business magazine, Echelon, in Sri Lanka, 
and was honored as Woman Entrepreneur of the Year by the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce and as South Asia's Best Female Entrepreneur of the Year by South Asian Business Partnership Awards. So those are our outstanding business women in tech and we are moving on to um, the third panelist that we have, um, Naomi Handunetti. And by the way, Jayomi and Naomi are both members of the Women's Chamber. She's the director of Handun Villas and Restaurants and the founder of the Siren, co-founder of Elixir Salon. Naomi, uh, as co-founder and director of a five-star resort property, Handun Villas, which was a TripAdvisor awardee for excellence, has spearheaded, conceptualized, and managed the business from the very beginning. A marketing, public relations, business development specialist. She ventured into entrepreneurship in hospitality and food. She, uh, I mentioned she's also the co-founder of a sustainable wellness brand that uses 100% natural raw material sourced entirely from Sri Lanka. And our fourth and last but not the least panelist, Shirley Bastian, who's the managing director of MT Food Group Private Limited. Shirley started her career in travel and then moved into the meat business in Australia with one of the largest processors in Victoria. She's focused on innovation, global projects, government liaison and oversees the admin and finance departments. Established in 2008 as Meat Tender Australia to deliver premium quality red meat from Australia to the world, Shirley has embedded world-class protocols in her business. One thing that she has maintained consistently is ensuring integrity in the export of her products and now supplies to hotel chains airlines among many customers worldwide, particularly US and Middle East markets. And she works with some of the world's leading hotel groups, restaurants, five star airlines and five star uh, hotels, airlines and the retail sector in over 20 countries providing comprehensive procurement service, delivering red meat, seafood, dairy and other high care products from many of the best producers in the world directly to the plates of consumers globally. So as you can see, broken the bias already. They are from various uh, disciplines who are who have who are in, in kind of what I, what I would uh, call uh, male dominated industries uh, and look forward excited to hear from them. I'm just going to pose three broad stroke questions to each of them uh, and I'm sorry but given the time and since we want to make it interactive, I'm just going to um, allow you two to three minutes to answer, to respond to it. After which we will take on the questions uh, from the rest of the audience. And perhaps if, if there's something that one of you um, mentions particularly, we can throw that up also as a question. The whole purpose of this exercise is um, that we give some amount of business advice, that we share our knowledge. And it is at the end of the day, International Women's Day week, as Michelle mentioned, and uh, we learn from each other. Um, so let's make the most of it. So the question, the first question, and we'll start with Trish, then we'll move to Jayomi, after which it will be Naomi and Shirley is each one of you is a successful business leader and an entrepreneur who has built a global brand through sheer dedication and ambition. What has been your inspiration to begin and ride this journey? Trish? Hi there, thanks for that introduction. I actually think my biggest inspiration was my father. He was a radio engineer and he was just very passionate about learning, about technology, about innovation. And that's the basis of my business that is licensing radio frequency technology software to corporations. So many of you may have even used our software without knowing because our software runs in like carrier air conditioners, Hewitt Packard printers, um, other customers are like Bosch, um, Honeywell. So, um, but it's very much a hidden technology. Um, it's sort of when I say, you know, we license radio frequency technology, people like sort of go a bit glazed usually, but, you know, it has its place. 
Um, and I've enjoyed the journey of, you know, our customers come up with amazing innovations and we get to be part of that and see, you know, their journey as they're developing their products. I think another aspect of the inspiration was the Hewitt Packard's Rules of the Garage. Um, I guess it's going back a long way in time, but um, I think they're very relevant even today as basic rules to start a business by. So that was another part of the inspiration for the business. Um, I think part of your question was, how did we build the business? Well, we bootstrapped. So basically, you know, as money comes in from one customer, we channel it back into more development and slowly over time, you know, expand the portfolio, um, expand the marketing that is possible. Um, so these days, the bulk of our customers are either in Germany or USA. So, um, I mean, those relationships take time to build, but we did just step through one customer at a time. So, but I think as well as um, that, that's more the business aspect, but seeing it is International Women's Day, I wanted to mention my mother's journey because she was well-educated. She was a trained nurse, but in her day, when she married, she had to leave. Um, she was not by law allowed to continue to work. So I think it's important to, to look back, see where we've come, because it's only by knowing the past that you can look forward um, and imagine a better future. So I think that's, that's all for that question, unless there's yeah. any other aspects. Sure, we'll discuss that later, but thank you, Trish. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah, over to you, uh, Jayomi. What was your Hi. inspiration, the unique trigger that got you onto the messenger? Yeah. Hi. Um, it's it's actually uh, I I would say one of the key aspects uh, because when I started Z Messenger back in early 2000, it was just the introduction of the mobile screen um, with a very monochrome, I think less than two inch screen. But the whole idea or the inspiration which I drew was to uh, see or kind of I envision this is going to be the screen of the future. So I was no engineer, I was no software developer, but then uh, the whole insight came, uh, say the thought came that, you know, this could be the anytime, anywhere connectivity. And that kind of led me to jump into the idea. Of course, there was my background uh, into marketing and management did play a part, though I was actually in my school days, my whole school life, I was preparing to be a veterinary surgeon. <laughs> But <laughs> just it took a massive turn in my life. And um, I just left my full time job because I was so excited by the fact that, you know, this could be a real wave maker in the industry. Um, so that was one of the uh, greatest key uh, uh, points. And also I'd li like to kind of point out, I think during the time when, when I started Z Messenger, we were like in the uh, Sri Lanka was going through a civil war. And most of my friends left the country. And I was actually, I, I got even entrance to you know, State California, uh, uh, State uh, University of California. But still, I, I wanted to stay back because I think I was driven by this whole passion of uh, the mobile and you know, it, what it could do to marketing communications and so on. And also, I think when I look back, when I reflect, what I felt was that actually I kind of found opportunity in adversity, uh, opportunity in, in a market where it was, it presented as a, a, a blue ocean. So I felt, you know, uh, this would have been the best thing happened to me. Uh, of course, I, I would have loved to go to a US college, but the whole idea of like staying here and doing something very novel actually kind of made me to realize the enormous success I could achieve. But having said that, of course, the first, I would say six to seven years, it was a struggle. 
So when Trish was talking about bootstrapping, I also thought about because I had massive challenges getting my seed funding because there was no startup culture in Sri Lanka and there was no um, venture funding that was widely available. But then what, what happened was, of course, the initial funding came through one of the family network. But then that with that, we were also getting into the, without knowing the idea of bootstrapping, but we were also getting into the idea of whatever the money that we got through our first clients, we reinvested back in the business. And I think that's how we grew. And But we kept on uh, exploring all the innovative aspects of mobile to kind of bring in the latest to the marketing communication world. So that was the, I think, main, main. actually, just simply the channel, the screen motivated me to be in who, uh, what I am today. Yeah, but thanks, Jeremy. Uh, great insights, particularly that you left your full time job. Many women contemplate doing that. They are scared to take the risk. And uh, yeah, we'll discuss that later. But by the way, what was your full time job? Well, I, I was account manager at one of the Swedish cosmetic companies. Oh, really? So I left, left that totally a different field and I left the university too. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Naomi, thank you for being on this uh, panel. Yeah, we'd like to hear from you. I mean, you also had full time jobs and uh, you left all of them to start uh, to become an entrepreneur. What was what was your trigger? What was your inspiration? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you so much and uh, for having me here. And uh, good morning, ladies. And uh, I'm so honored to be here to be representing uh, Sri Lankan entrepreneurs and also representing the chamber. Uh, so what really uh, triggered me was uh, in terms of my uh, character, uh, because, um, you know, we as uh, women are married, I have two children. So I've kind of what really... Uh, triggered me was uh, people used to kind of relate to me as my uh, husband's name, you know, my husband's wife, Ranish's wife. But I kind of later on, I figured out that's not what I want. I wanted an identity for myself. Uh, so uh, that really kind of hit me hard, you know. Uh, so that's that's where the inspiration, the motivation actually came from. Saying that uh, I was brought up in a very... Uh, uh, very uh, encouraging family my parents used to really encourage me that you know you are a go-getter you can get anything done so i came with that uh, mentality as well and saying that i uh, represent one of the most challenging uh, industries uh, in sri lanka at the moment which is tourism uh, from easter bombings in 2019 and then covid and now when now again we are having this uh, crisis uh, but saying that uh, i have moved uh, the business from uh, because if you had looked at 2019-20, I had absolutely no reason to uh, kind of market my business to the local community. But we had no other option but to uh, change the business. Uh, actually, re we re-engineered the business altogether to cater to the uh, Sri Lankan market. Uh, so that's how I have been able to uh, survive thus far in the industry. Also looking at uh, COVID, uh, I mean, uh, it was really tough for us, but saying that I've uh, ventured into uh, this wellness brand that I've, uh, coconut-based wellness products, uh, which is Elixir Ceylon. So this is actually a uh, kind of a diversification. Uh, rather, COVID actually, uh, like Jeremy mentioned, COVID opened a lot of uh, avenues for us to think differently, uh, all of that and also the siren is also a part of uh, the diversification process where I, which is a marketing a process outsource company uh, so that's how i have been able to survive thus far and my inspiration thank you so great thanks naomi and yes we will come to the whole pandemic and the challenges and how you all faced it as well but one uh, key take out from that is um, uh, given adversities and at times of challenges you re-engineered the business, I'm quoting your word, to um, to come out stronger, and that's great. Uh, and Shirley, we have you now. Um, Shirley, we'd love to hear from you. Shirley? Hi. You can see me now? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, asking me to be part of this panel. I started my journey in born in Bombay 
in those days, Mumbai today, educated, did my commerce degree in Mumbai, then got married, moved to Chennai, had two daughters there and did my master's in travel and tourism. So worked in the airline industry for the first eight years of my life, then came to Australia 36 years ago. And because my children were so young, I was forced to go take the job that was closest to home. And the only thing I could get was in a meat plant doing accounts because I'm an accountant by 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 degree. I'm an accountant. So I um, thought as much as I did not want to be an accountant, I was forced pretty much. That was the path that was chosen for me. And I've never looked back. I've. Uh, it's it is a man's world, um, and so realistically, I feel I stumbled upon it. I know everybody would like to hear a great story about plans I made, and I, but there are none. I have always just opened myself to all prospects, and then I find life just flows through you, and you you uh, you keep your mind and heart open. They say education is better than medication, and in many ways, it is because that's found forms a base for anything we do in life. But um, my, I think I get my entrepreneurship from my mother's side of the family. My mother was a very, she worked for SO for all her life and was an account manager there, started at the age of 18 and fi finished at 58. My dad was a professional sportsman, played uh, foot, soccer, cricket, and uh, hockey for the state of Maharashtra. So he was professional and, and he worked for Mahindra. So he was more engineering background, which I knew I was never going to be. Um, uh, I like to think that I have just grown organically. So I started out and worked for other companies and learned everything that there was to learn. So I started out with just doing the accounts. I then started doing carcass yields in the boarding room. From that, my knowledge of how an animal is cut up, what it yields, what are the percentages, all work worked out clearly. I was then told to do marketing when my boss went away on holiday. And when she came back, she said, oh, you've got the job. You don't have we, you. I, I don't want this job back. So that's how I stumbled into the meat industry, which is a very male dominated industry. I can't say it, that it has been an easy road. But as I said, uh, if you keep yourself far away from all the chitter chatter and the going on in the background and stay focused on what you want to do, and take do to the your, the best of your ability. You get the returns. Great, Shirley. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm I'm not butting in, am I? No, uh, no, not at all. Yeah, <laughs> no, but but that's that's very interesting. I mean, you started working there, and then you end up ended up as a co-owner of the business. Yes. Yes. I mean, that that itself uh, is, and we'd love to hear more about uh, how you ascended okay. to that role. Okay. Uh, yep. uh, in a moment, in a moment, I'm just going to now bring in uh, my second question, which is, um, I mean, undoubtedly, the last two years has been the toughest for all humankind and for all businesses, some taking a hit uh, more than the others. According to Harvard Business Review, countries with women in leadership have suffered six times fewer confirmed deaths from COVID-19 than countries with governments led by men. <laughs> so hurrah wow. for us. Women CEOs, board directors exhibited a different leadership style than men during the COVID-19 crisis, leaning towards empathy, adaptability, accountability, diversity, diversification, as mentioned by uh, Naomi. As a woman, what has been the greatest challenge in navigating your business? And as a woman in business, what have you done differently? I know. Look, and if you don't, if you have something else to add to it, please feel free. But broadly, um, I think all of us would be interested in knowing um, how it impacted your business positively or negatively. Trish first. Hi, Trish. Hi there. Sorry, it took me a while to get back on. Yeah, no, thanks I, yeah, for the I question. Think, I think if all the panelists can keep their um, uh, videos on, it would be great. <laughs> and then we can make it more fireside chatty. Okay, yeah? that sounds good. Okay, yeah, I think um, I don't actually see that gender came much into uh, my decision making. I mean, there's no doubt. COVID has been tough. I mean, it's just been like 
one hit after another, you know, it just keeps rolling through the problems. But my approach was very much just to, okay, what are our problems? What's the biggest of those problems? We'll deal with that first and then one by one go through the list. I think though for us, there's probably been three main areas where there's been problems. And one was the emotional side. I mean, we've had people that have been sick, we've had people in hospital, we've had people with mental health issues, and that's, I mean, employees, family and customers all struggling. So, I mean, that's been difficult. And I guess we've just managed as best we can. You know, we help when we can. Um, we've even organised medical intervention for some of our employees if that's been needed. Um, I guess, yeah, it's just really a matter of seeing what's going wrong and what can we do about it. So that's the emotional side. Financial side though was big for us too. So we got quite a big hit straight away. Like March 2020, our customers panicked. And when our customers panicked, they stopped buying. Um, so things got postponed. Um, so, I mean, that was quite an immediate hit. So that financial side came through pretty quick for us, but it seems to be sort of looking up now. So, I mean, the light's at the end of the tunnel. And probably the other side was just the management and logistics side. So that was the side that made us have to re-engineer our business too. We had to stop some product lines because it just wasn't feasible anymore because of the you know, in Australia, freight costs went up about four times. I guess that's a problem that's hit other people here as well. Um, but the whole working from home and curfews and travel bans, um, I mean, we just had to manage our way through through all of that. So, yeah, my real thinking is that I don't know that gender really paid a part in any of that decision, um, but yes, yeah, certainly it was it was big impact. Okay, so I guess now who's next? Jainomi, Jaiomi. I'm so um, sorry activity issue so so sorry and i missed out have we got on to uh, trisha I, I didn't hear uh what you said but can we now get on to jayomi if you don't mind of course so no problem <laughs> no problem yeah good heavens what we had to live with okay. yes please sure yeah um i like to kind of uh bring this perspective because it is true that we live in a very unprecedented time. I think our families, our businesses, if our can, institutions. Yes. As a woman, is there, was that something as a woman that was unique that you, that, that, uh, you did or that you saw what was done uh, in, in overcoming the challenge? See, yeah. uh, what I can reflect is what I did. Right. I don't know whether it was because I'm a woman or whether it's my role as an entrepreneur or a disruptor. So what I saw during this whole pandemic, of course, there was a massive shift. There were massive uh, changes to how we usually do things. So one aspect was that during this whole pandemic uh, time where I went, I saw the need in the whole pharmaceutical segment where people were desperately trying to get their life saving medication. So that made me, and from my digital technology, understanding the digital consumer behavior, that led me to launch a whole new business entity called MyMed, which is like an aggregated pharmaceutical platform. It's like Uber, Uber to pharma pharmaceutical and over-the-counter products, So, which I launched in early 2020. But I had been having this idea and I had done a prototype. So I was kind of little ahead. I didn't expect a pandemic to come. But then that became one of the uh, larger entities during these last two years. And actually, when Shirley was mentioning about the brand Swiss, actually, uh, I just want to tell Shirley as well, I, I, I was the first one initiated the whole conversation with state government, uh, 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 state uh, uh, Victoria, state government, and brought the whole online version of Swiss to Sri Lanka. 
which was about, I think, uh, uh, less than, yeah, about eight, eight to 10 months ago. So this was one of the uh, diversifications that I brought in and also on the online digital marketing uh, business where we realized because as I said, the unprecedented time, the economies in Sri Lankan economy, we are going through a very tough time of our foreign exchange and a lot of there's outflow from the country. So I looked at this problem because there's a lot of outflow in terms of digital advertising revenues, which are like taken by the big networks like Google, it could be uh, Facebook or whatever. But I also looked at, is there a way we as a, one of the pioneering agencies could do something to retain some of the ad dollars in the industry. So then th that also led to a new innovation called Ad Studio, which is like a Google similar display ad network, which has connected over 350 publishers right now in Sri Lanka. So most of the ad dollars, online advertising dollars or rupees will be retained inside the country. So these are like some of the areas where I said that always a chaos presents an opportunity. So I think successful people are the people who kind of understand this whole opportunities that are presented in a chaos and then kind of, you know, come up with the innovative solution. Because my company's sole theme is if you are not the disruptor, definitely you will be disrupted in this new industrial revolution that we are going through. So this is the kind of, I don't know, I think I've been believing that and this opportunity presented, so I went ahead it. So I don't know whether gender played it, but this is how yeah. it was. But wow, 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 very impressive, absolutely. Uh, my med is something that I also used. So now okay. I know it, uh, yeah, yeah, that it belongs to you. And Naomi, yeah. I know the tourism suffered the most, tourism sure. and hospitality, and, and since 2019, but uh, yeah, we'd love to hear your story on that. Yes, uh, thank you, Razani. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, COVID uh, stopped uh, our foreign income almost. I mean, it was just nil. Uh, saying that, uh, towards uh, just th this, uh, this happened. Uh, I had to face this issue. Uh, no sooner. Uh, this COVID was kind of getting out there. And when we had uh, foreign guests, uh, what I felt was that the villagers were so scared. And uh, some of the youth who were working with me uh, stopped coming to work completely because it was something new. You know, uh, people didn't know how to deal with it. So I had uh, some, of, some of my staff members just quitting their jobs simply because of this uh, pandemic. And if you have uh, kind of... Uh, uh, tourists coming in, we will not come to work kind of situation, you know. So that was, uh, I was very empathetic towards the team uh, as well. And then towards come April 2020, there was zero tourists. We didn't have any tourists. So I mentioned about the business re-engineering process that we yeah. did to cater the uh, entire, the menus to everything to cater to the local market. Uh, so uh, that to, to date, now it's 2022, so to date, I have a really good uh, mixture of foreigners as well as local guests patronizing my uh, business, uh, which I'm really uh, happy to uh, mention. Uh, saying that, I think uh, as a woman, uh, if you ask me how, what did I do differently, I think I was much more closer to my team, trying to look after their families, trying to understand their situation, how they think, how they behave is something that I think I would have done a little bit better than a uh, male, but saying that, uh, of course, uh, the, the difficulties and the adversities are the same, I would say, uh, irrespective of gender. Uh, saying that, uh, I I always, uh, I try to be as optimistic as much as possible, even right now, we are struggling. But saying that I'm very optimistic to try and you know look at other markets. How can we uh, go out there? How can we do things differently? What are the opportunities out there? Saying that uh, uh, emotionally, financially, we've gone through a lot. But I think I've become much, much more resilient uh, than who I was back in the day. I have uh, started two other businesses uh, during COVID. Plus, I started uh, reading for my doctorate at AIT as well. Uh, so these are some of the things that I have kind of probably didn't even think of, of uh, if not for COVID. So I looked at that as a positive thing as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And Shirley, we'd love to have your thoughts on this. Yeah. You're on mute here. Yeah. 
So COVID was the toughest time for us because being exporters, uh, flights stopped, tourism stopped, airlines stopped, all our major suppliers just stopped. So we were, even though it hit Australia in March, we were really hit in January when China and the rest of the Northern Hemisphere went into meltdown. And we did not have an order for six months. However, my experience has always, you asked me how I got into a business after working for somebody for 20 years. When 2008 came, the business that myself and my business partner, Dirk, uh, were working in went into receivership. They just went to water. They had four plants in Australia and they just could not survive. So they closed down and that's when Dirk and I started this business. So we started at the worst time in history in 2008 after the GFC. The GFC was September. We started in October. So we were we we I think we were already resilient. Uh, we just had to keep an open mind, know that nothing lasts forever, sit tight, make sure that you have all your ducks in a row, you're looking at your finances, you're getting the right advice from your bankers and from your advisors. Global Victoria have been tremendous when it comes to uh, offering us a leg up on so many fronts that uh, I can't tell you I am indebted to them for life, really. They, are, they have been tremendous. So yes, how did what, what did I do differently? I think... Um, I have never tried ever to fit into the masculine role of being a business person. That comes with a certain kind of baggage. In Australia, we call those peacocks, just colloquially speaking. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, because they love to strut about, you know, they're private school educated, their chests are out, they want to show everybody who they are. Mm. That was never, never, ever my Dirk or my personality. We were down to earth. Transparency was always the way we started business because our last, our boss who I worked for 20 years with was such a character that he would tell a customer something, deliver something else. And I learned that that was the best way to lose a business and to lose a customer, a good customer who has supported you for many years. So we knew that Taking our customers and our suppliers on this journey as partners with us was the only way forward. 100% transparency and honesty in everything we do. We will never say that we are giving you something and give you something else because yeah. no chef wants to see today a steak that melts in your mouth and tomorrow a piece of rubber on your plate. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah. you know, that, uh, yeah, we stuck to yeah. the plan. I did a lot of studying in the two years because because there was no work. So I, I did plenty of studying every online course that I could do. We started an organic uh, slicing business on the domestic market, which we never had any footprint in because we are 100% export until this point in time, till COVID hit. We started, we started that. And we opened up to seafood, dairy, uh, broth, dry goods, sliced product, uh, you name it, jerk, beef jerk, everything. We had to open our portfolio and hence our change of name from meat tender, which was meat centric, to yeah. everything. Vegetarian, vegan, fruit, vegetables, you name it. We do everything now. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, thanks. So two, two points that I took out from that, from, your, from what you said, Shirley, taking customers, treating customers as your partner on your journey. And also from what Jayomi and uh, Naomi mentioned, you know, chaos presents opportunity. One sure. last question, and I think we'll have to uh, we'll have to just give you a minute and a half because uh, time is catching up. Uh, what is the one major business advice, your own business mantra that you could share that will aspire women entrepreneurs? Uh, just just one, you know, if you could uh, like like a parting shot. What is it, Trish? I think it's be brave. Do what you want to do. I mean, I guess being brave isn't not feeling the fear, but just going ahead and doing what you want despite that. Um, but enjoy it. Like if there's no enjoyment, the success is a bit hollow. Great, Jayami. Yeah, uh, I would say it's it's a, a, a context actually to it's a time for you to develop your resilience muscle, because I think resilience for me is the the characteristic of any kind of entrepreneur 
for the success. So through positivity, through creativity, and also like looking uh, for priorities because in, in a crisis, priorities are one of the top areas and then structure and experimenting. So these are the, I think the key ingredients to build your resilience muscle. And that is what I think as women, we are good at it. So this is something we, which we need to project to our companies to build that resilience. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And we, now we move on to Naomi. Yeah, the one uh, for me, uh, actually, like Jami said, the resilience also, no matter what, what adversity comes your way, don't give up. But the moment you give up, that's the end of everything. So don't give up and also don't get too carried away with negative news. Everyone speaks about negativity, but nobody's there to, you know, inspire you, to push you to do what you should be doing. I think, you know, uh, no negative news, please. That's my message. Surely. So my mantra has always been feel who you want to be and be who you want to feel. Joyous, happy and open. That's that's what I can say. I know past generations, unfortunately, have handed us down. You don't think, think, think. But we we have now reached a stage where we are all thinking too much and we are suffering from anxiety and depression and all sorts of things. I think if we move our energies slightly lower into our hearts and into our stomach, where our gut instinct kicks in, we are going to be all the better for it. And lastly, being a woman, we are multitasking all the time. That comes in the nature of our jobs, correct? We cook, we clean, we do the laundry, we do the garden, we feed our children, we bath them, we just so yeah there's nothing that we don't do absolutely i mean and i would also like to add from me um women inspire each other i mean that is the networking uh is is always helpful and you know we, we feel we're comforted in knowing that some another woman shares the same uh aspirations shares the same challenges as us and we've taken a lot of time um do we have time for um we have uh, for questions shiran shehara from the ceylon chamber yes, and if we there are a few questions if you all are happy to yeah we'd love a couple of questions before we close i know it's almost 12 but if there are and if anybody can type it onto the chat box um yeah Just one little thing, uh, if I may, and uh, while waiting for the audience to pose some questions is, Trish, um, you mentioned something um, that's quite pertinent. Uh, you spoke of your mom who had to give up her job when she got married. Uh, or, or rather, you, you spoke about a law that prevented women pursuing, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about about that because uh, I mean we don't have those constraints now but culturally there are uh, culturally and uh, from the community that I come from also typically uh, I mean now it's changed but when I started uh, working and when I started pursuing education it was frowned upon and I'm talking okay. about yeah, sure. Yeah, so in my mother's day, it was law in Australia that nurses were not allowed to continue working after marriage. Oh. So, I mean, that was, um, you know, pretty severe. So obviously these days it's much more subtle. But I think there's still the case where, you know, women are judged by their skirts, not their skills. And we need to move away from that. Well said, well said. Has anyone else felt the same way now in today's context? I mean, I know it's quite prevalent. I, I but... can say that having lived on both sides of the world, I was yeah. born and brought up in India, which is my son-in-law is Sri Lankan, and I've spent lots of beautiful <laughs> holidays in Sri Lanka, yes. <laughs> and I've got two grandchildren who are Sri Lankan too. So <laughs> I uh, living on both sides of the, I was shocked when I first came to Australia 36 years ago at how far behind Australia was compared to compared to India uh, on how women were treated. I mean, you know, um, maternity leave. I know that we used to get fully paid maternity leave in India, even when I had my babies 40 years ago. 
My daughter is 42 and the other one's 40. So, you know, we got fully paid. That only came into Australia a few months, a few years ago. And that too, it's not with pay. It's you take hot take, you know, you can take your one year or two years off, but you're not promised a job when you come back. You're not promised what job you'll get when you come back and you're not paid for it. So uh, in many ways, I know we look at South Asia as being uh, probably developing world. But in many ways, we are far more advanced when it comes to women and looking after women because we've always revered our mothers. Even even our husbands revere their mothers and look up to them. I've always treated them, you know, with respect and love. Um, sometimes you don't see that on the side of the world. I'd which is like, sad. like to comment on that, if I may. I think it comes from the history of Australia. I mean, Australia was populated with mainly young men. Um, until World War I, the population was like hugely skewed towards males. I think 70% males or something like that, even mm. at the point in time of the early 1900s. So the whole culture has evolved from young men that are living without their families. I mean, they were sent here as convicts, many of them. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's, even though that it's perhaps not recognised, um, kind of the views have stemmed from that. Yeah, I agree 100% with you. I, I, it's not that it's not recognised. Nobody talks about it, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody well, wants, other, it's, yeah. it's the elephant in the room, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it would be interesting to know if, and, and now since we're talking um, Australia and Sri Lanka and we brought in India into the conversation, to see if, if countries, and I know India is doing this consistently, recognizing um, the power, the, 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 the value of uh, women in entrepreneurship and um, embedding certain policies and laws to promote women entrepreneurship in uh, the respective countries in the hope that, um, you know, it, it will impact our GDP. In 2015, the Women's Chamber lobbied for and worked towards um, uh, a mention in, in the national budget where 5% of Sri Lanka's loan allocation would be entirely for women entrepreneurs. And we got that wow. passed. Uh, but, but, but again, there are challenges, huge challenges because... Oh, the banks, <laughs> you know, ha have their uh, have have their profiles of whom they want to lend it to, and so they'd rather choose larger people. And the women entrepreneurs themselves are not fully aware of this uh, uh, allocation. But but that's the thing. I think sometimes women, I mean, uh, apart from progressing in their entrepreneurship, in their enterprise, to look at what they could and and for that it's associations like uh, women's chamber and similar associations across the world that could actually advocate for policies towards women entrepreneurship maybe something to think about yeah any it, other it, questions it, Sorry, it is a ahead. it is a bit um i don't know disappointing to know that in 2022 we are still fighting for equality i thought we were always made equal i've always been brought up to understand I had a brother and three sisters, and we were all equal. There was no distinction made between being a boy or being a girl or being anything. So I don't know where this difference comes from and why it is so askewed in the in the world. I would love to find out why. I I don't I don't get it. I have never looked at anybody and thought, oh, he's a man, I have to treat him like this, or he she's a woman, I have to treat her like yeah. that, or he's white, I have to treat her like this, and she's black, and I have to treat her like. It doesn't even occur to me to think of anybody like that. We are all human beings and we all have given the same chance at life and some of us use it and some of us unfortunately can't. That That's the difference. Anybody else for questions or comments on what was discussed? Yeah. Um, from the chamber side, I think it was absolutely uh, really, really enlightening, I would say. Like, you know, how women in different um, arenas come into play. And, you know, I hope everyone was being empowered because I was. So we will be the others. I hope so. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Michelle everybody. and Rosani and Naomi and Jayomi. Beautiful Perfect. names, such lovely Thank names. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed <laughs> listening to everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Should we uh, uh, should we close? Are there any closing remarks? Uh, uh, Michelle, would you like to add something before we close entirely? I mean, we've already. Yeah, please. We'd love to hear. Sure. If it's only, I, uh, Vidya and I have been texting going, this is a really great conversation and uh, we definitely want to catch up with uh, you guys in person when I'm next in Sri Lanka and, and do something there. Uh, I wrote some comments there that, uh, you know, the, the lessons that, that you shared, uh, your resilience, how many of you created new businesses and new business opportunities through that time, something else. And um, I loved all of your mantras, so I'll be posting those up on social media, probably for my Feel Good Friday spot tomorrow. <laughs> really has been invigorating. And Shirley, yeah. thank you for bringing up the elephant in the room. I was really yeah. fascinated to get your uh, perspective on that and also Trisha's context, which I hadn't really thought through before <laughs> as well. So I think that's an important conversation to have as one, well. One day when I'm... When I, when I do meet you, I will tell you what happened to me this morning at, at an American Chamber of Commerce event in the city with Global Victoria. Un unbelievable that things like that can still happen today, but they do. And it didn't come from a man, it came from another woman. So not not for this, not for this forum. Another day. Okay. Well, I'm hoping okay. to catch up with you next I month. I hope so yeah. too. Good. Okay. okay. Thanks, and, everybody. Uh, Thank you. So sh shall I shall I then um, give the parting words and then shall we close? Yes. So yes. on behalf of the Women's Chamber of Industry and Commerce, incredibly, incredibly proud to have and honored to have uh, moderated this panel and the conversation. I too would like to take this conversation forward. I mean, there's lots that we can do. I know there's a saying that women bring each other down, but you know, to me, the Women's Chamber has been has been the support group. It's 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 like minded women, it's people that have boosted me up. And so I think organizations such as um I mean Okay, let, let me digress a bit. When I was chairperson and uh, when I attended the Silonchman, this was in, back in 2005, they asked me why a women's chamber? And I had to say, why not? But I had to reflect on that and, and then I found out that it's because women need that support and they, they need to... Uh, they need to know, they need to hear, they need to hear success stories, they need to hear the challenges. And to all of you, great work go ahead keep going onward and upward keep breaking the bias see you thank soon you. i hope our thank you so forward. much thank, thank you, you so much this is energy bye 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 bye, bye.